Think of your favourite deity, male, female, or giant crocodile, it doesn't really matter. Now it's likely that that deity has a specific field or domain associated with them. For example, the god of the sky, the goddess of wisdom, or perhaps a deity associated with something as abstract as time. It's then very easy to identify these deities because of what they're associated with, and these associations commonly branch out to other things. A god or goddess associated with numerous ideas is not uncommon. But with Hermes we have a jack of all trades and a god of many titles. The messenger, the trickster, and the conductor of souls are just a few. The sheer number of things that Hermes is considered to be the patron of is just one of the many reasons that he is perhaps the most unique deity in the Greek pantheon. We mentioned a few of his largest roles being the messenger of the gods and the conductor of souls in the afterlife, but Hermes was also considered the god of trade, merchants, wealth, and commerce, as well as language, crossroads, sports, athletes, boundaries, borders, thieves, graves, and heraldry, and yet somehow was still not finished because he was also the patron of shepherds, the protector of travellers, and the divine trickster. So I think it's fair to say the ancient Greeks couldn't exactly avoid the worship of Hermes. The earliest depictions of Hermes can be traced all the way back to the Mycenaeans, who referred to him as ur Meha, which isn't too different to how the Greeks pronounce his name today, with the H almost being silent, or sounding more like Er. Who we call Hermes, the Greeks call Hermes. The exact origins of the name Hermes aren't exactly too clear, but quite a few scholars believed it to have originated from the word Herma, which referred to a heap of stones that marked a boundary. From this then derived the word Hermi, or Hermai, which were a set of boundary markers used by travellers dedicated to Hermes, and thus we can explain his association with travellers, boundaries, and borders. Just like the vast majority of Olympians, it should come as no surprise to anyone that Hermes was a child of Zeus. His mother, on the other hand, was a nymph named Maia, the eldest of the Pleiades, the seven daughters of Atlas. According to popular legend, Zeus visited Mount Silene, the home of Atlas's daughters. It was here during the dead of night that he would impregnate Maya, and somehow by the crack of dawn Hermes would be born. The idea of a child being conceived and born within a day would certainly seem more than strange, but when we consider the fact that Hermes possessed unmeasurable speed, a birth that took mere hours certainly isn't the weirdest thing we've seen thus far. The first thing Maya did was wrap her newborn son in swaddling bands to keep him safe while she herself rested, but even as a newborn baby, we start to see the trickster side of Hermes, he managed to eventually squirm free of the swaddling bands, and the first thing he did was run all the way from Arcadia to Thessaly, where his brother Apollo grazed his prized cattle. Hermes then stole several of the herd, and took them back home, where he hid them in a small grotto near the city of Pylos. But that wasn't enough adventure for the newborn Hermes. On his way back to his cave, he caught and killed an enormous tortoise, using its entrails to create the first lyre. Apollo, believing that his cattle had in fact been stolen, then travelled to Mount Silene, informing Maya that he believed Hermes was responsible. Maya turned in to see her son still wrapped where she left him, claimed that Apollo's accusations could physically not be possible. However, Zeus had been watching his newborn son quite closely, and though he was amused by his antics, he demanded that he return the cattle. Hermes then proceeded to take out the lyre that he previously made and began to play. The music was so enchanting that Apollo just had to have this instrument, and so he made Hermes an offer. He could keep the cattle that he had previously stolen, but in exchange he would have to give Apollo this new instrument. Hermes of course orchestrating this entire situation did not hesitate to accept the offer. The lyre would go on to become one of Apollo's many symbols, and he would eventually become a grandmaster of the instrument, all thanks to his cunning baby brother Hermes. This story not only explains Hermes' association with thieves, cattle, and shepherds, but we also get a brief insight into his interest and talent when it came to music. Not to mention how cunning Hermes was, being able to trick and outwit his brother despite being born on that very same day. For those of you wondering about the Roman or the Etruscan counterpart to Hermes, he went by the name of Mercury, and to be honest, they were quite similar. The Romans, however, did manage to narrow down Mercury's patronage to mostly just commerce and travel. So with Hermes now no longer being a baby, we can take a look at his numerous lovers, children, and I guess overall family. Being the son of Zeus, Hermes had countless siblings, a list that is far too long for me to go over in just one video, but we can use the rule that if it came from Zeus, then it was most likely related to Hermes. Similar to his father, Hermes had many nymph and human lovers, with the most famous of these being Dryope and Merope. Along with these nymphs and humans, Hermes also had numerous romantic relations and affairs with other goddesses, including Phaeto, the goddess of persuasion and seduction, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and Hecate, the goddess of magic. Like many of the other Greek gods, Hermes had numerous children, but these children never really reached the heights of fame and notoriety of the other Greek gods' offspring. 
The child that I'm sure many of you have heard of is the god of the wild Pan, who does have many different fathers, but there are stories that claim his parents were in fact Hermes and Dryope. I'm not entirely sure who I'd consider Pan's father, but Hermes and Pan do certainly share some characteristics, such as their fun, laid-back, and tricks-the-like nature. When you couple this with his impressive strength and speed, Hermes being his father is definitely a distinct possibility. His other children of note included Tyche, the goddess of fortune and prosperity, whom was mothered by Aphrodite. Together with Aphrodite, Hermes had another child, by the name of Hermaphroditus, an extremely handsome young boy who fell in love with a nymph named Salmachus. Salmachus prayed for the two to be united forever, and eventually her prayers would be answered, but perhaps not in the way that the two wished, as they were merged together, creating one androgynous form, both man and woman, hence their name being a compound of Hermes and Aphrodite, and later being the origins for the word Hermaphrodite. The rest of Hermes' children are either beautiful maidens or minor heroes. These included Meritilus, whose mother was an Amazon, Euderus, who was one of Achilles' five commanders in the Trojan War, and lastly Angelia, who followed in her father's footsteps, becoming a spirit of messages, tidings, and proclamation. With Hermes being born on Mount Silene in Arcadia, it's no real surprise that that is the oldest known location of his worship. Some believe that the first temple dedicated to Hermes was constructed by King Lycoon, the king of Arcadia who was turned into a wolf by Zeus. Because of the sheer amount of things that fell under the patronage of Hermes, naturally his worship would spread across the entire country, with a rather large cult located in Athens, which then radiated through the whole land, with temples and statues being seen everywhere. The statues of Hermes commonly depicted him as a young teen, and that's because many saw his role as helping or guiding the young into adulthood. This was most common amongst hunters and soldiers, as they would often have some kind of ceremony that signified their transition from childhood into adulthood. These often took the form of a specific hunt or battle, Regardless of which, these were extremely stressful times for what we would consider today to be just children. The image of Hermes at a similar age to these children, we can assume bought them a certain degree of comfort, and provided them with the confidence they needed to face their coming trials and tribulations. During these festivals honouring Hermes, it was commonplace to see animals such as goats, lambs, and pigs, along with the customary cakes and honey. However, some of these festivals involved more than just a simple sacrifice in the name of Hermes. The Hemea were a series of festivals that celebrated athletics and gymnastics, and it was fairly commonplace for adults to be excluded from these festivals, because they were seen as the initiation for a young boy to become a man. A large portion of Hermes' followers were also made up of farmers and shepherds, because of his association with nature and cattle. They would look to Hermes to keep their cattle healthy, as well as safe and out of the way of thieves. Which is quite ironic when you think about it, because thieves in need of guidance would often turn to Hermes. So who exactly Hermes would help in this situation, I don't really know. Maybe he flipped a coin, or maybe he just ignored them all. There are also those that believe Hermes was capable of travelling through different planes of existence, drifting in between whenever he was needed, and that is how he could so easily travel between our land and the land of the dead, being able to see worlds that were invisible to mortals, as well as other deities. When we see statues of Hermes, he usually appears as a fairly young man, wearing a winged cap and winged sandals, holding the caduceus, his winged staff entwined with two serpents, which also served as his primary symbol. His other many symbols included the rooster, the ram, the hawk, the tortoise, the lyre, and the strawberry tree. The trait, however, that most people recognise Hermes for is, of course, his remarkable speed. Now, for those of you wondering how fast Hermes was, I can't really give you a number in terms of miles per hour, but my extremely super professional guess would be really, really fast. Hermes was also an extremely intelligent individual, and though at times he may appear as a bit of a trickster, by no means does that mean he was evil or cruel. He appeared to have quite a strong connection to humankind. When he wasn't tricking the other gods for his own amusement, it would be to help humanity. In some stories, Hermes was sent by Zeus to share his knowledge of humanity and teach them the value of justice, to help form a relationship between mortal and god, and this arguably could be why Hermes shows so much favour to humanity. Over time, the image of Hermes began to change, similar to that of Dionysus. He appeared as a mature, bearded man dressed as a traveller, and this highlighted the more intelligent friend and teacher to humanity, which definitely paints a nice contrast between the young, scantily clothed, athletic depictions of Hermes. There isn't much said about his time in the underworld, but we know he was a conductor of souls, helping ferry the dead to Hades. He would take his golden staff and send the dead into a deep slumber, and whilst in this trance, Hermes would guide them through the dark and treacherous path before them. The next time they woke, they would be in Hades. This process also led many to believe that Hermes was a god of sleep and the dreams of Omen, which were messages sent by the dead. It's believed that after the abduction of Persephone, when Hermes was sent to bring her back, he was soon after appointed the guide of dead souls. 
Apart from Hades, Persephone, and Hecate, Hermes was the only other deity ever really allowed to leave the underworld without any repercussions or consequence. If we take a look at the love story of Orpheus and Eurydice, when she is granted one day on earth to see her husband, it is Hermes who escorts her to Orpheus and then back to Hades. So now we finally move on to the stories that Hermes appeared in. The story of Hermes stealing Apollo's cattle as a child is definitely one of his most well-known stories, but perhaps the most celebrated was his battle of Argus Penipetus, the giant with 100 eyes. The story begins with Hera, well, being Hera, by transforming a woman named Io into a cow because she was jealous that Zeus loved her. She then placed the giant Penipetus the Orsean to guard the cow. In some stories it was actually Zeus who transformed Io into a cow in an attempt to hide her from Hera, but she demanded the cow from Zeus and once again assigned the giant to guard her. Hermes was then instructed by Zeus to steal the cow, but the giant was warned of his arrival and so he was unable to sneak past the giant, forced instead to slay him in battle. Hermes then used his staff to close all 100 of the giant's eyes, sending him into a deep slumber. He then cut off the giant's head with his golden sword and threw it off a cliff onto the rocks below. When the giants then marched on Olympus, Hermes killed the giant Hippolytos with his gold sword, and quite often Hermes can be seen wielding this gold sword in battle. Hermes also played a part in defeating the biggest giant of all, Typhon. When Zeus faced Typhon alone for the very first time, he actually lost. And after this encounter, Typhon cut out Zeus's tendons, leaving him powerless and defeated. Hermes, however, was not amongst the gods who had transformed themselves into animals and fled to Egypt. He instead came to aid his father, stealing back the tendons and restoring the power that Typhon had stolen from Zeus. Hermes also appears in some stories that we can consider a bit more mainstream, helping Perseus defeat Medusa and convincing Calypso to free Odysseus and his men. He also regularly appears in Aesop's fables, one of my favourite stories is the reason why Aesop believes that all craftsmen are liars and why cobblers were the worst of them. Zeus ordered Hermes to instil a dose of deceit in every craftsman, and so Hermes took a pestle and mortar and began to grind the drug of deceitfulness into a fine powder. He then applied it equally to all craftsmen, except for one. The last craftsman was the cobbler, and there was a large amount of powder left, and so Hermes took the remaining content of the mortar and poured it onto the cobbler, making him the most dishonest craftsman. There are so many stories that feature Hermes that just like his many children and lovers, if I sat here trying to explain them all to you, I'd be here all day. However, in terms of his fellow Olympians, he would often challenge them to the Greek games, as well as regularly playing tricks on them, stealing Artemis' arrows, Aphrodite's girdle, and on occasion even taking the trident of Poseidon. There aren't too many deities brave enough to risk angering Poseidon, but Hermes was clearly one of them. Personally, I really like Hermes, and not just because he's basically the god of everything, but because the trickster is an archetype you don't really see much in Greek myth, and Hermes is definitely not your ordinary trickster. Despite all of his responsibilities, he still somehow finds time to show his more fun side, playing tricks on the gods while never neglecting his own duties, helping countless others, and fighting numerous battles. I do also find it extremely funny that he was conceived and born within a day, and the first thing he did as a newborn baby was steal his brother's cattle. Hermes very clearly cares about his fellow gods and his family, helping them out whenever he can, but he also never really backs down when it comes to helping humanity, regardless of the consequence from his fellow gods or goddesses. I guess what makes Hermes such a likeable and respected figure is the fact that he just does everything, and whatever he chooses to do, he happens to be extremely good at. He has all of the positive aspects and likeable characteristics you'd want or expect from a god without much of the negative. The phrase jack of all trades and master of none comes to mind, but Hermes is literally a jack of all trades and a master of all. So let me know what you think about Hermes in the comments below. Did you know the sheer amount of things that Hermes was a patron of? Are there any stories involving Hermes that you particularly enjoy? And are there any aspects of Hermes that you would consider negative? Let me know in the comments below. As always, I've been your host, Mythology and Fiction Explained.